Speaker, please call the roll. Senator Cedillo. Cedillo here. Dutton? Here. Dutton here. Oropesa? Here. Or, Oropesa here. Honestad? Here. Honestad here. Steinberg? Here. Steinberg here. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to begin by apologizing to my colleagues and the staff and the members of the public for being late. Um, had uh, some budget business to attend to, but I also recognize everybody's busy and we'll get, we, we will get started here. Um, Senator DeSonier, is he here? Mark DeSonier? I want to accommodate uh, the good senator's schedule if he's here. Senator DeSonier is here to introduce one of our nominees, uh, Art Carter, and without objection, <clears throat> then we will take file item uh, 2B uh, ahead of 2A, and then we will get to uh, Mr. Walters uh, right after Mr. Carter without objection. Um, let me, before I turn it over to Senator Sonier, uh, for an introduction, we welcome Mr. Carter to make a brief, uh, brief opening statement on, the, on this nomination. Um, Mr. Carter, who uh, we've known for a long, long time, uh, fills the labor slot on the board. And until he was appointed, the slot had been vacant for over two years, and this is only a three-person board. So the slot is important. When we heard uh, Mr. Robert Pacheco, a former colleague of ours in the Assembly last August, the committee raised questions about the culture of the board. Key stakeholders have expressed uh, legitimate concerns about some of the board's practices, both at Ms. Traeger's uh, confirmation hearing and also at Mr. Pacheco's. We understand that Mr. Carter himself is not chair of the board and that some of the issues are administrative in nature. Issues like triple booking of cases and the lack of hearings in the Central Valley are issues uh, that aren't directly under Mr. Carter's control. <clears throat> but some of them were serious enough to result in a letter to the board signed by 47 DOSH um, personnel. During Mr. Pacheco's confirmation hearing last August, we asked the stakeholders to get together with board members to see what progress could be made on some of these problem areas. So <clears throat> we, we are um, interested in getting a status report from Mr. Carter. Um, through this confirmation hearing uh, on how those conversations have progressed and uh, how we might work together to make sure those concerns we raised uh, a few months ago are in fact addressed. So with that, I want to welcome you. Thank you. I also want to introduce our colleague, uh, Senator Mark DeSonia, to make an introduction and then we'll allow you to introduce any family or friend uh, who is here with you, make an opening statement and then We'll let the grilling begin. All right, there we go. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Pro Tem. Well, uh, Mr. Carter lives for danger, so he asked me to introduce himself, introduce him. Um, all those issues you brought up as chair of the Labor Committee with my vice chair, uh, Senator Wyland, we have, as you know, have had hearings about those issues, uh, had many employees come and speak to us about them. So. Uh, while we appreciate some of the efforts um, by the administration and some of them have been effective, we're looking forward to uh, Mr. Carter continuing to serve on the board. Um, as you may know, uh, Art served for eight years as, as the director of Cal OSHA in the Jerry Brown administration. Um, what you probably don't know is Art and I have something in common. Um, if fate had been better, he and I would be members of Congress right now. Uh, Art ran for the Congress from uh, Contra Costa County some years ago. I won't say how long. Um, so we're happy to be of service here, and I think Art will continue to do the outstanding job he's done in the past, not to mention the fact that obviously he has a great deal of expertise in this area. So, Mr. Carter. Thank you, Senator. Uh, thank you. Senator uh, Steinberg, members Welcome. of the committee. Uh, I do have a few family members here, so I'll just briefly introduce them. Uh, first, my brother, Philip, and uh, his wife, Barbara, and uh, their oldest son, uh, Joshua, who is an aspiring politician in his own right. Uh, oh, he's got a long ways to go. He's only 19 years old. All right. Is he registered? Needs <laughs> <laughs> an intervention. Uh, uh, Senator Stalinay's uh, reference to my uh, ill-fated attempt to 
run for Congress. I don't know what I was thinking. I, I, I got a very early lesson in what. <laughs> me, me too. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> well, we, we, we will have a uh, congressional candidate support group immediately after, <laughs> after the hearing is completed. Actually, we have uh, such a group that the acronym is No Clue, no, New Organization of Congressional Losers. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Ashburn, maybe. <laughs> You know, I, I got a very early lesson about what name identification means. Uh, I chose to run in a primary with eight other people, including George Miller, whose father had been a state senator for 20 years, and then there had been a congressman, George P. Miller, in the late 40s and early 50s and early 60s, representing Contra Costa and uh, Alameda County. In any case, I, uh, it was a very, very early lesson. That's ah, worse than John Garibaldi. <laughs> <laughs> let's get to the hearing. Here we go. <laughs> so let's go. Uh, I do want to thank you for this opportunity to uh, talk a little bit about my own experiences. And also, I want to thank Governor Schwarzenegger for this opportunity to serve. Uh, it's uh, a welcome opportunity for me. As uh, Senator DeSalione has indicated, I was the previously uh, executive director, actually secretary treasurer of the Central Labor Council of Contra Costa County, and that was my first uh, experience a little bit. It's a very industrialized county in some ways, agriculture and otherwise. And uh, in those days, I was in some cases involved with some of the affiliated unions in some accident work sites, mostly construction, but uh, also a few uh, nasty circumstances with some of the oil refineries. I was appointed by uh, Jerry Brown as chief of Cal OSHA at an early age, 34, uh, 1976. And during that time, one of the things I attempted to do was to get a real firsthand experience to go out in the field with inspectors, see what it was like to actually do an accident investigation, respond to formal complaints, and so forth. Uh, I also, during that time, helped uh, negotiate uh, voluntary compliance programs with uh, Bechtel Corporation and the State Building Trades Council on the uh, San Onofre Nuclear Power Pro uh, Project. And uh, I also played a major role in the implementation of the then separate safety program from the industrial hygiene program, which was part of the uh, uh, health department. Um, as a board member, I have a, a perspective that the Standards Board, the DOSH Compliance Board, and the Appeals Board have equal responsibilities to accrue, achieve reduction of injuries and illnesses. And uh, Senator Arnestad, you asked me a question last week when I saw you about what were some of the injury and illness rates. And uh, the most recent figures that I've got for 2008, these are injury and illness rates, all industries about 4.4 per thousand. On the fatality rates uh, in 2006, 3.1, and then 2 point, uh, in 2007, 2.6. So clearly there is a relationship, I think, between the state administering its own program and a reduction of the, uh, of the uh, injury and illness rates. Uh, the Standards Board has a responsibility to adopt clear regulations to protect workers. A DOSH to respond to complaints, conduct accident investigations, and issue penalty citations where violations are discovered. And the Appeals Board is to promote worker safety by deciding employer appeals in a fair and consistent manner based upon the Labor Code, court decisions, decisions after reconsideration, which are commonly called DARS, and <coughs> regulations did, uh, adopted by the Standards Board. Uh, during my approximate 11 months of service on the board, the board has done the following. First, uh, it has in September adopted a new calendaring protocol, which was the subject of a lot of criticism in a letter signed by some 47 division uh, people, uh, inspectors, lawyers, and so forth. This calendaring protocol is one that has hearings on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, 9 a.m. and 1 p.m. The most complex case is taken up in the morning. If it, for some reason, does have to go beyond that, then it'll continue on that day, and if it needs to continue even to the following day, it does. Uh, no inspector <clears throat> will be given more than one case per day. 
this was also a matter of a considerable uh, criticism of the board in that it was uh, strongly stated by many of the inspectors that by having to handle two, three cases or more sometimes that they were being forced to settle cases that they might not otherwise do. Uh, secondly, during the last uh, year, the board has conducted appeals board workshops. Uh, these are being conducted by presiding law judges, quite experienced, and last year in Los Angeles, San Francisco, and San Diego, these covered subjects such as pre case preparation, common avoidance, uh, uh, avoidance of common mistakes, uh, other kinds of issues that are normally seen in uh, hearings conducted by administrative law judges. Uh, these hearings or these meetings were open to all stakeholders, so there are people from the division, uh, employer community, labor community, others. Third, the board began, I believe it was in February, and concluded in uh, August what was called an abatement pilot project, which was a project intended to get a real sense of how serious cases, serious violations, where there was no abatement, the appeal was undergoing, how those could be expedited in a way that would normally deal with the issue of no longer having worker exposure to unsafe conditions. Uh, normally, the process from the time that an appeal is first filed to what may be ultimate conclusion, if it does go all the way to a hearing, can sometimes go up to 10 months. This pilot program was one that typically began uh, pre-hearing conferences and discovery with the administrative law judge and the parties 30 days after and then continue, uh, continued, hopefully concluded by a 120 day period. It had a very high success rate. It was well received by the employer and the labor community. We are now attempting to look at whether we might be able to find funding resources to reinstitute this program. It is one that does take a lot of time. It required virtually full time for a presiding law judge, or I shouldn't say a, a, an administrative law judge, not a presiding law judge in the North and the South to first evaluate these cases. And I should mention, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, that the board right now has a total of six administrative law judges. We have two for all of Northern California, and the balance are in the Southern California area. Their assignments reflect what is the workload and so forth. There is one vacancy owing to a resignation in uh, December, uh, and more recently we've been advised that uh, given the state's financial crisis that uh, we may have to identify an additional 1.6 positions. Uh, for um, reduction. Uh, on January, in January of this year, the board began monthly advisory committees to deal with proposed regulations from a number of stakeholder groups, uh, organizations such as WorkSafe, California Labor Federation, uh, the State Chamber of Commerce, and uh, others. Uh, so that process will continue probably officially insofar as those advisory meetings until uh, September, October, and then hopefully we'll be able to come to some resolution. This is a fairly lengthy process, as I'm told by the attorneys who have done this before. Uh, it has to be approved through the, uh, the Office of Administrative Law for uh, final certification. So I... Uh, find myself in a, in a new situation here uh, as a board member. I've had to learn what ex-party communications mean. Um, as I think some of you know but from my bio, I'm not an attorney. And when I formerly was with the division, I was used to getting into solving problems and, and uh, getting information from wherever I could to help resolve it. Um, there is also the difficulty of a three-member board when 
you're complying with the bagley Keene Act, and at no time can two board members meet together, even outside of on housekeeping issues and so forth. So that's been a thing. So um, I'm uh, here before you to ask for your confirmation. I'm uh, twice my original age and asking you to recycle me one more time, and uh, I'll take your questions. So that means you'll be back at 128, is it? The, uh, you know, I have like a, that, family genes are reasonably good, but I don't yeah. think that good. <laughs> um, thank you for your statement for laying out some of the issues, Mr. Carter. Uh, all the regulatory boards that we have jurisdiction over are important, but this, this is especially important board. I mean, given that you're dealing with the health and safety of of California workers. I want to dive in a little bit to uh, your comments around uh, the stakeholder process and the meetings that uh, you have participated in. It sounds like there actually has been some significant movement around the calendaring issue which you described. But what about some of the other issues? We've heard complaints that hearings are often held in places where witnesses uh, may not be able to testify because of transportation or access, farm workers, for example, heat illness citations. Well, what's being done on issues like that? Uh, you, of course, Section three, uh, 376 of the Labor Code does talk about venues being as close, hearing venues being as close to the accident or the complaint that is alleged to have a violation as possible so that witnesses can be there. Uh, the board has added the city of Fresno to a regular hearing location. We can, uh, although this is very difficult sometimes, arrange for other cities. Bakersfield may be one of them. The reality is that uh, this board, like a lot of other agencies, is facing situations not unlike what I remember going through with the board immediately after Proposition 13 passed. And and up with the board with the division. And you try and comply with what are realized circumstances. I do take seriously, and I think the rest of the board does, the need to have venues as close as possible. We hope if we get additional resources, Mr. Chairman, to be able to have more venues on a regular basis. Uh, clearly, uh, I've listened to some folks in some of these hearings talk about uh, heat illness issues in uh, the valley around agriculture. Uh, there are issues involving logging and sawmill and others uh, way up in the woods. Uh, we don't, you know, have an office up there, although the Department of Industrial Relations does have offices up there. So it may be possible for us to do more given some additional resources. Of course. Can I ask, uh, is it the intention to move, when you were outlining where the administrative law judges are located, you indicated two in the north, the balance in the south. Uh, is there intention with the opening of the Fresno office to have the presence of, uh, or the designation of a uh, administrative law judge for that part of our state, that big part of our state? Uh, Senator uh, Orpiz, it would be incorrect for me to tell you that we're going to have an administrative law judge situated there. Uh, we are, it's the intent of the board to have hearings there and as much as possible to calendar or group uh, proposed appeals in that location so that we can have, if it's for a one day, two days, or three days, whatever, as many days as we need in the Fresno office of the Department of Industrial Relations to conduct those hearings. But uh, we are not in a position to make a commitment that uh, we would have an administrative law judge stated there all, uh, full time. We right now have two ALJs headquartered in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. The balance of the ALJs are in West Covina, mm -hmm. uh, Van Nuys, I believe, and Los Angeles. Uh, they, they move around considerably and using DIR offices to, co to hold hearings as necessary. But this issue of uh, holding hearings as close as possible, I think, is one that I feel strongly about, just for the reasons that a lot of people talk about. Administrative law judge needs to have as many witnesses as is necessary to 
get a good decision. Now, there is an alternative here, and the board is discussing this with some ALJs. There has been some discussion about having video conferencing. Uh, and of course, it is open to any uh, witness to, to be heard in a declaration, and that can be submitted to an administrative law judge. But the issue, it would be incorrect for me to say that we would be able to have someone full-time right now, given our resources. Yeah, well, I, you know, I just feel like there ought to be a, a revisiting of that question, because unless there is a very minute number of individuals who have business with the agency, there ought to be the full opportunity for service within a reason, and, and I know reasonable is, is a subjective term, but the Central Valley is a huge area, and it also, uh, in terms of workers, probably has um, more than its lion's share of low, lower income uh, workers. And so to expect lower income workers to be able to travel distances or their witnesses to travel distances, um, it just seems, it seems unfair to me. It seems unfair. And you know, you deal with what you have in terms of resources and you deploy those resources fairly, equitably, even if they are not sufficient. I, you know, I would hope that we can get more resources, at, you know, sooner rather than later, um, to um, to OSHA uh, Appeals Board because it does import such important work. But in the meantime, it just seems like the board ought to look at the realities. And, and I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there are very small numbers of people who are complainants in that area. And then, of course, there's a the chicken and the egg, which drives it. Does it does uh, does the appeal process, is it driven in part by the lack of access or the other way around? I, you know, these are things I don't know the answer to, but would you say that there are a fairly small number of, relatively speaking to the rest of the state, um, complaints that reach well, this level? Uh, you know, uh, Senator Orpez, I, I can't tell you the numbers yeah. in by s geographic areas. I, I do know, because mm -hmm. I've, listen carefully in some of the advisory meetings that we've had, that uh, the issue of heat stroke is an important one. In fact, California is probably the first state to adopt a heat stroke standard. And I know that in doing so, it's important that there be compliance. And if people are not complying and so forth, then we ought to be able to, you know, to hold hearings in which there's been an allegation that an employer is not, complete, not uh, complying with that. And that's where I think it's important that witnesses on that issue. There are other issues in the valley as well. You've got an oil industry down here at Bakersfield area. You have construction. You have other agricultural mm -hmm. issues as well. Uh, I don't think any of the board members believe that any one part of the state should take a second seat to another part. The, 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 the distribution right now of the administrative law judges, however, does reflect the workload insofar as where the complaints are coming in larger numbers and so forth and try to handle it that way. But I hear you very loudly and I think that uh, if other resources do come in, uh, this would certainly be a priority of mine and I, I think the other member would Thank feel you. the same way. Thank you for that. And okay. I just, I also wonder if you could reflect a little on, uh, and not today, but reflect uh, on the question of the chicken and the egg. You know, whether the complaints in part are driven by access or not. Right. You know, when you're looking at where the demand is. Yeah. Just, you know, something for thought. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Senator Dorpeza, uh, the, the chair had to step out. So would sure. you, uh, want to continue with your uh, line sure, of questions? Sure, I'd be, I, I, I just have a couple more questions for right. Mr. Carter. Um, and we have known each other a long time and I know your reputation and I think you're a, frankly a very excellent choice for this, for this seat, for this important position. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask uh, about something related to the, well the U.S. Department, I'll just read it straight out. The U.S. Department of Labor wrote a letter to Candace Traeger, the, the chair of the board. And among other things, the letter says that, quote, unfortunately, it appears that in defining serious physical harm, 
the board current the board's current policy limits this phrase to the correct to the excuse me to the labor code definition of serious injury it goes on to say if even this finding is correct a determination of the osh program not being at least as effective as federal osha is possible what steps is the board taking to address the concerns in this letter? I, I believe that was a letter sent in December um, to the chair of the board. Uh, this is an issue that's before us right now. Uh, I have to tell you in some of the discussions that I've been involved with, with some of the attorneys to the board, uh, it's not as simple as, as I'm being advised as being suggested by a federal OSHA to simply adopt wholesale uh, the federal OSHA serious standard without also amending the statute in California's labor code. Um, so that I, I've listened, I've read some of the comments and I've listened to some of the comments of the chief of the division who's raised these questions and I have to tell you that it's, it's a matter just before us right now. I can't really comment on it, uh, but uh, I know it's, it's quite it uh, important and uh, in fact, one of the questions I asked when I first heard about it was whether or not a federal complaint, commonly known as a CASPA, had been filed and had not. But I, I understand that this is an important It is, it is important. Yeah, it is an important issue. Uh, so what I want to tell you is that it's, it's before us right now, and I think it's a question here of whether or not it can be dealt with by regulation uh, or whether it does require a statutory change or whatever. And I, I don't have an opinion on that right now. Okay. Well, whatever that conclusion is, we, you know, we need to deal with yes. whatever that answer is. Yes, yeah? yes, absolutely. Good. Very good. Um, let's see, my other questions related to what we've already talked about, I think. Um, yeah, I think that's it. That's it for me, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you. Senator Dutton, have you any questions? Okay. I know that uh, Senator Steinberg has a few more to go, but he'll be back, so I'll, I'll throw in a couple here. Okay. Uh, unless uh, Senator Cedillo wanted to ask any questions. Okay. Um, you alluded to it in your opening remarks. I appreciate your doing the research, uh, re you know, based on our earlier conversation a week or so ago. Uh, we have statistics that have come out that shows the cost of regulations on small businesses in California um, are, uh, can be uh, arrived at about $135,000, $137,000 per year. So the cost of a small business, somebody who employs less than 25 people in this state, can automatically figure to add $130-some-thousand to the cost to their overhead uh, if they want to do business in California. Part of that are the regulations coming from the bureaucracy, and one of them is Cal OSHA. Uh, the question that I had asked you is, um, not all states have a state OSHA. The federal guidelines, the federal OSHA, seem to be adequate in many states uh, and in fact, in states where businesses are leaving California and traveling to other areas to set up business. Um, and I, I guess my question was to ask you to justify why do we need a Cal OSHA? And at that time you were going to research and maybe you want to go b check back over those figures, but uh, I'll let you answer that. Well, I don't know that I can quantify the cost of complying with Cal OSHA standards, but in a broader sense, as we talked about last week, Senator, uh, when President Nixon signed the federal OSHA law in 1970, uh, all states had the option of exercising their own program. Uh, then Governor Reagan, along with the legislature, determined that it was better for the state to have its own program, and that was a policy position that was strongly supported by almost all the employer community, the Manufacturers Association, the State Chamber of Commerce, the California Labor Federation, and lots of other folks. I think they did that for a lot of reasons. I mean, one, they have accessibility. 
in the rulemaking process, the standards board, to have accessibility to the people who enforce the law, uh, with the division and so forth, uh, the ability to appeal here relatively close rather than having to go to Washington, D.C. with the Federal Re uh, Review Commission. I mean, we talk about venue issues here. <laughs> you can imagine how difficult it would be if you were having to consider serious uh, appeals going that far. On the issue of costs, I take the view that most employers want to comply with the law. But I do think that there are other issues here that have to be factored in when you're talking about you know, a cost issue. For those employers who choose to take the risk that they are not going to comply with the standards and so forth and their injuries, not only do they face the possibility of citations from OSHA, but they're also going to see possibility of their worker comp rates go up considerably, as well as civil uh, uh, li li uh, litigation. So th I think there's a lot of issues here that have to be put on the table with respect to that. Uh, in the end, we have a federal law, which I strongly support, and the state law, to guarantee the right of workers uh, protection. How that gets handled, I think, is one that a state like this can determine best using its own resources. Previously, in the early 1980s, then Speaker McCarthy introduced legislation, AB 7, 8, and 9, I remember them very well. I don't want to think when I remember all these numbers so quickly, but that was a three-bill package that required that all regulations of various regulatory agencies had to go through a process of determining whether or not they were clear, whether they were enforceable, whether they had some kind of, I don't want to use the phrase, but cost-benefit analysis to everybody, and were they uh, protective. Uh, that is a process that goes and continues today. This regulatory process that I referenced earlier uh, will ultimately go through that Office of Administrative Law for that purpose. So I think if you're making a choice as a state as to whether to have a federal program or a state program, the experience of California is one I, want, I think to have a state program, no matter where you sit at the table. Well, thank you for the sure. answer. Okay. And we had a, a longer discussion in my office, and I appreciate your doing the research. Sure. Thank you. Are there uh, questions from other members, or should we hear from the witnesses? Let us hear from uh, the witnesses in support, and then there may be uh, some more questions. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Wedge. Mr. Chairman and members, Scott Wetch on behalf of the State Association of Electrical Workers and the California State Pipe Trades Council and the Sheet Mill Workers. Um, here in support, I've known uh, Mr. Carter for 22 years and worked with him uh, from inside the building and worked with him uh, on the outside of the building, worked with him very closely on a number of issues. And uh, I think everyone who has worked with Art knows that he's represented both labor and management. And uh, I think his uh, calling card for all the years that he, he walked the halls here was that he was a consensus builder and that he uh, was very good at listening to all parties before rendering a, a, a position and that serves him well today on the OSHA board. And we would certainly like to see him continue in that capacity and would urge your support. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Wedge. You're welcome to use uh, that mic or whatever you want, whatever is quick and efficient. <coughs> Quick and efficient message received. Christy Bauma representing the California no, not, Professional not person. Firefighter. <laughs> uh, my organization likewise has had the honor of working with and knowing uh, Mr. Carter for many years, my predecessor, um, who Brian Hatch is also, also my father. Um, the two of them have uh, created great policy in this state and uh, served the people well in their capacities. And so we're just proud to be here to support Mr. Carter in this endeavor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the committee, Jeremy Smith, on behalf of the California Labor Federation, I'd first like to thank you, Senator Steinberg. Um, last January, you petitioned the governor at Ms. Traeger's hearing, or after Ms. Traeger's hearing, the chairwoman, to fill the labor seat. And it's because of your um, uh, uh, due diligence that Mr. Carter was appointed. 
Um, I know that we're very happy uh, that he is there. And um, I, I wanted to say just a couple of very quick things. He spent his whole life uh, since he graduated college working, helping workers. Uh, I think he brings an excellent uh, set of uh, excellent skill set and a, a distinct uh, knowledge of labor issues to the board, which will be very important moving forward. Since he's been there, there have been some incremental changes uh, regarding scheduling specifically uh, to our concerns that we have raised in past hearings. Uh, I think that is partly because he's there giving his sage advice, uh, but it's also because of your, um, your due diligence as well. The board has a long way to go, we believe, uh, to serve workers better. And um, we are happy uh, that there has been some change, but we're glad that Mr. Carter is there to help push it forward. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, Martha Guzman, California Rural Legal Assistance Foundation, here in support of Mr. Carter, but also want to reiterate some of the concerns that have still yet to be addressed in a very slow, what seems to be a extremely slow uh, rulemaking process that is beginning. And frankly, because of the current chair leadership, uh, who is not even open and very publicly not open to a lot of these changes. And just to hit home on the venue issue because it's such a critical one. You know, Covina is actually just two hours away from Coachella and just two hours away from Bakersfield. So you can get a Sacramento person down to Fresno, takes a little longer than getting somebody from Covina to Bakersfield. And we have, and Bakersfield is not even central, you know, I mean, it's people still have to drive to get to Bakersfield. So I really do appreciate you know, even the willingness uh, for Mr. Carter to look at this issue because frankly, the rest of the board has been unwilling to and has used the issue of budget constraint as uh, a complete barrier where it frankly should not be because in terms of mileage, <laughs> strictly mileage, Covina is closer to some of these locations. So I appreciate um, this committee's oversight of this board and I hope to make a lot more progress uh, with a more well-represented board makeup. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and members, Barry Broad, on behalf of the Teamsters, Art Carter is a mensch. That's all I have to say. <laughs> oh, one other thing. Senator Onestad, just, just a little bit of thing from memory. Senator Duke, Ma I mean, Governor Duke Magian abolished Cal OSHA, and then the voters restored it. So the voters of California have essentially decided that we should have a separate state program. So that's one thing none of you guys have to worry about now that the voters decided. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Broad. For Mr. Chairman and Senators Bill Duplissy, I, I actually served on the OSHA Appeals Board, and I can say I've also known Art Carter for 24 years. And as a legislator, I can tell you that probably one of the easiest folks in the world to deal with uh, on issues was Art Carter. And the reason was that he was open to, uh, open to virtually anyone's, uh, to, to hear anyone's opinion, and he was uh, uh, motivated to get things done and to find a way to make something happen. And all the problems that Cal OSHA Appeal Board uh, deals with, that's really the, the crying need, is to get some things done. And I can't think of anyone who is better suited to be on the appeals board than Art Carter. So I hope you support his uh, reappointment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Duplissy. Ms. Schreiberg? Fran Schreiberg, and I'm here in my own capacity, but also to convey a support from WorkSafe, um, of which I'm one of the founding members. But on my own behalf, um, I've actually known Art for 30 years, which after listening to that, it's a little long time. I went to work for him uh, in 1980 when he was the chief of the division, and I think he would be an excellent um, permanent member of the OSHA Appeals Board for a number of reasons. One is that he really does have a good understanding of health and safety issues. Um, and for those things that are going to be new to him, he, he listens well, and he'll he'll pick up on the issues and I think that he's an extremely fair person. So that's a, uh, an important characteristic. In terms of seeing that play out um, at the uh, meetings that I've attended of the OSHA Appeals Board that um, Art has been at, he's been the one person 
in that community, in that board, that has, in fact, asked questions that are perceptive and has listened to both the Cal OSHA staff members and to worker advocates um, and to try to consider the, the important issues that they had to raise. I think this is going to be an uphill battle with um, other members of the board in terms of the <laughs> petitions we filed for regulatory changes, but I think that um, at least on behalf of Mr. Carter, we'll have a fair hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members, Danny Curtin, California Conference of Carpenters. Uh, I think Art Carter is the best pick for Cal OSHA that any governor could have made, and I wanted to make sure everybody heard me say that. Uh, I spent a few minutes at the Department of Industrial Relations, and I know one thing about employers, what they were interested in. They were interested in fairness, consistency, and timeliness of decisions. And I think the thing that drove them the most crazy was the lack of the timeliness that the decisions would be drawn out and drawn out and drawn out. Art has more experience in this area than anybody I know, and he's been around long enough to bring a wisdom to the decision-making process. I say that uh, without hesitation. I must also add that when Art ran for Congress, I actually walked precincts um, at the time, and that was really a stretch, but I can tell you, uh, George Meany, Art was with the labor movement at the time. George Meany was the president of AFL-CIO and many remember a cigar-chomping labor leader. He wanted to know who this young upstart was because he didn't have quite all the blessing from the national running for Congress from Cosa Nostra County. Do you remember that? I think you can find that. I think you can actually find that in the minutes of the AFL-CIO somewhere. So uh, he, did a, he didn't win that one, and we, we've been the beneficiaries. I hope you support our Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Senators. I'm Bob Raymer, representing the Building Industry Association. I've only known Art for two and a half decades, but in that short <laughs> period of time, uh, I've gained a lot of respect with Art. So the state would be well served with his appointment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Raymer. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Mr. Mayor, excuse me, Mr. Chairman, members, uh, Jose Mejia with the California State Council of Laborers, in proud support of his confirmation. You know, I came up here uh, just a little over 10 years ago, and Art was one of the first people that I met, and took much advice from him. And I can certainly assure that he's a man of commitment, dedication, and as my uh, the early testimony was was said earlier, in regards to being fair to the employer community as well, he is a major advocate for workers. There's no doubt about that. Uh, I just don't have the privilege of saying to you or any of you that uh, I was there when he was running for Congress, obviously. Uh, nor was I walking precincts for him at the time. I wish I probably would have been part of that, but sometimes when I look around the room, I probably backtrack that and maybe not wish that. Um, but Mr. Chairman, members, I urge respectfully you consider his confirmation. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Mejia. Mr. Conaty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members. Pete Conaty from Pete Conaty and Associates, and I'm representing myself, and I've had the pleasure of working with Art both inside and outside the building. When I uh, originally started in the building 24 years ago, I worked with Republicans and got to know Art very well, and, and he, is, uh, he is known, as you've heard, as a problem solver, a straight shooter, and his word is his bond, and he is probably the best qualified person for this job, and as you heard from his report, he is out there solving problems. So I would urge you to confirm him. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Mr. Kennedy. Are there witnesses in opposition to the nomination? Is there a motion? So moved by Senator Honestead. I do have one quick comment and question that I just want to get on the Number one, the Senator Rapaz's questions, I believe. Um, the use of technology um, to, to ensure that uh, people who can't travel to hearings have access to, to, to participation in the hearings. I would love a report back on what we can do uh, through non-general fund uh, strategies to be able to enhance the board's ability to use technology to deal with this conundrum between efficiency in terms of uh, getting the hearings and the, and the cases done and making sure that the hearings are fair and that witnesses and parties have full access. Um, okay. okay. Sounds reasonable to me, uh, Mr. Chairman. You're calling the shots here? We're calling the shots, but I would love your, uh, we need your guidance on that question. Okay. And, uh, I, I, we will work with you. Let's call the roll. Uh, thank you. I mean, for, 
you know, just your willingness to continue your public service. And uh, I think uh, you have widespread support and respect, and i uh, glad you're willing to do this. Well, I, I'll, uh, I'll try to do my best. I, I haven't a clue how I'm going to meet the expectations of these Republican supporters and management supporters, along with some of the labor people. But I don't want you to ask me what promises I made. But in any case, I'll do just, my best. Just the way you've done it all of your <laughs> professional life, okay? Right, thank Please you. Please call the roll. Senator Cedillo? Aye. Cedillo, I Dutton. Oropesa? Aye. Oropesa, I Honested? Aye. Honested, I Steinberg? Aye. Steinberg, I. It's for nothing. We'll leave the roll open for Senator Dutton uh, to vote, but your nomination will move to the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Let's now move uh, expeditiously to uh, Del Monte M. Walters, who is up for confirmation as the director of the, of the Department of Forestry and Fire Protection. Mr. Director. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Welcome to you. Again, uh, we want to accord you the um, opportunity to introduce any member of your family or special guest uh, who is with you here today and welcome you to the committee. Well, you're looking at a, a great uh, number of the members of my CAL FIRE family behind me, as you can probably tell, uh, but none of my uh, actual family members are here today. Okay. Okay. Well, let me ask before we begin. Uh, I doing okay? Okay. okay. <laughs> Court reporter comes first in this, uh, in this business. Uh, please, an, an opening statement. Okay. Again, uh, my name is Del Walters, and I'm the director of the Department of Forestry and Fire Protection, also known as CAL FIRE. In addition, I'm also your uh, California State Forester. I want to thank you for the opportunity uh, to be considered here today uh, for confirmation. I'm a California native. I've lived in California all my life. Uh, the majority of uh, my uh, upbringing was in uh, rural southern Monterey County. And in 1971, that's when I went to work uh, for the first time as a seasonal firefighter for what was then the California Division of Forestry. I served in nearly every fire rank in CAL FIRE. And uh, in addition to that, I've also been a forester. I have a Bachelor of Science in Forest Resource Management from Humboldt State University. In CAL FIRE, there are 21 units that are grouped into two uh, regions, north and south. The majority of my career, I've worked at the unit level, uh, San Benito Monterey, Sonoma Lake Napa, and Shasta Trinity. Um, during that time, I also became qualified as an incident commander, which is the top rung of... Pardon? Um, an incident commander, qualified as an incident commander. I will slow down a little bit, try to make that 430 mark. Um, <laughs> and I've never run for Congress. So, um, in the world of the incident command system, in other words, running um, um, incidents of all sizes, uh, I ascended to becoming an incident commander and was assigned to uh, one of uh, CAL FIRE's 10 major incident command teams. And during that six years, I was deployed 12 times on major incidents. And previous to that, I also assumed leadership roles in, in a wide variety of incidents uh, throughout California. And uh, my specialties were operations and planning. In 2003, I became the chief of operations for the northern region in Reading. And they're charged with the, all of the fire protection programs and, uh, and aviation management for the northern part of the state. In addition to that, uh, there's what's called North Ops there, and that uh, allocates resources to all types of emergencies throughout the state, uh, primarily in the northern part, but in concert with the southern part of the state. And it's also done in conjunction with our federal partners and local government. That's um, there's also the dispatch for um, Cal EMA uh, Fire and Rescue Region 3, the northeast part of the state. You know, several years, uh, after that, I became the assistant region chief for Northern California. And 
that was my first experience in becoming involved in all of the programs. I'd worked in a variety of programs throughout my career, but at this time, with the, uh, my first experience in, in having all the programs in CAL FIRE um, to address. Several years ago, I would have never dreamt of being here today. Um, in spring of 2008, the former director Grijalva piqued my interest in the position. Grijalva. Okay. Challenges, how you see how you see the job going forward, the relationship between your office and the legislature, and I'm mean, happy to mm -hmm. do it any way you like. I just I think it would be helpful to focus on on where we're um, where we're heading with your department here. Okay. Okay. Um, where we're heading with my department, as you may have seen in the goal statement, some of the things there um, were in these trying times right now, one of the greatest focus is to make sure that we maintain a good initial attack capability. In other words, to go out and address um, uh, initial attack fires, keep them small so they don't become larger. Um, very concerned about any uh, degradation of that capacity in, in California. The other thing is in resource protection. Last year, um, when we were addressing the, the budget, one of the things I was most concerned about was any further uh, decline in the budget for resource management. Uh, we've lost about 10 percent, excuse me, 25 percent of our budget now in total since the turn of the century. Uh, we're right down to the wire as far as uh, any kind of um, uh, that might be a good place to, sure. to, to, to sort of launch right in here sure. in terms of the budget because it's obviously something that is uh, on all of our minds right. and Californians' obviously. minds as we continue to grapple with these historic deficits. CAL FIRE, uh, as we understand it, now provides full service to 81 uh, cities and counties and other special districts. They're called special uh, category A or schedule A contracts. Right. And the intent, of course, is that CAL FIRE is to be reimbursed dollar for dollar uh, for the service that you provide. And I want to make sure, or I want to get your take first, and then I want to make sure that, in fact, it, CAL FIRE is recouping all costs of providing services, for example, full overhead, additional pension costs for firefighters. Is that the case? And if so, how are you ensuring uh, through independent audit, Department of Finance review, any other means that we are in fact getting every dollar that otherwise will have to come out of some other starving area of, of public service. Right. We are required by the state administrative manual to recover full cost for all goods and services that are provided under these contracts, and we take it very seriously. Uh, we have a, an Office of Program Accountability internally. Uh, we just completed an audit on uh, what's called the, the overhead fund that funds some of the support positions um, that, that handle the increased workload because of these local government uh, programs. Do, do, do you account for all the overhead? The pension issue, obviously, is also another one that's of interest. Uh, that's of interest here. Right. I know one specific question that came up as I was uh, doing some visiting uh, last week had to do with when we blanket employees in from local government. If what we do with the pensions, and in fact, their existing pension ends at the point where they come into state service and they begin their state service um, in the same pension uh, program and PERS as any other CAL FIRE employee. What we do in what the Schedule A is, is simply a schedule at the back of a contract. And it talks and uh, deals with specifically those um, resources that are provided by the state but reimbursed by the county. And for every one of those um, employees that's part of that, there's a benefit rate that's attached to that. And however, whatever charge that 
uh, employee incurs, be it salary, be it overtime, be it retirement, be it health benefit, those are all captured and charged back to the entity that contracts with us. All right, this may be something I wanna ask our, our budget committee just to take a look at as part of our, I'm sorry? Yes. Certainly. Uh, just, you know, our, our uh, oversight responsibility here as a, as a legislature, let's, uh, let's have our budget committee look into that question. We welcome that. Let me ask you about, um, beginning in 2006, the legislature provided year-round staffing uh, for your department and in part for the purpose of allowing the department to engage in uh, enhanced fire prevention activities. Uh, and yet, I'm told that since 2006, the number of defensible space inspections on state responsibility areas is only about 15% of the uh, of the potential to be inspected. Uh, this is based on 2008 numbers. Is that acceptable to you in terms of the percentage uh, and why isn't it higher? I don't have the exact numbers, but what I can tell you is that year round staffing was for only f uh, three units in Southern California. Uh -huh. um, and we increased our defensible space inspections between 2006 and 2008 uh, from 14,386 to 33,172. So we did make a significant increase in uh, those defensible space inspections during that time in those areas that were affected by the year-round staffing. Okay. My last question, um, I didn't know this until I studied up for this hearing, but your department is uh, also responsible for forest management, which includes the issues of salmon restoration mm -hmm. and our fisheries. <clears throat> and of course, we've had a little back and forth with the Board of Forestry about the amount of time it has taken to promulgate forest practice regulations. Um, how do you, balance your duties, you're a firefighter. Um, do you think it is uh, appropriate and is it, I don't know what the word is, comfortable, if you will, for you, your department to also be in charge of this other duty which is seemingly unrelated to, to firefighting and fire prevention? Yes, I do. And um, one of the things that has been very rewarding in this is becoming part of the National Association of State Foresters. And regardless of what state you're in, uh, wildland fire is an issue. I mean, it is uh, one of the things, especially with climate change, um, it is, there's two things that stand out with climate change. One of them is sea rise, the other is wildfire. And so they do go hand in hand. Um, we've seen a lot of issues uh, throughout the Western United States regarding uh, pathogens and uh, insects. And so what happens there is the forest health declines and fire uh, becomes just that much worse. In other words, harder to control. So they do fit together. Um, it, you did ask a question though about balancing the time or, or the focus, which is interesting. Um, it was pointed out to me earlier and asked that question and, I, and it dawned on me that I see resource management as part of the tapestry of my department. Uh, in other words, I, I may only have over my overall budget, resource management is down to like 5% of it. But I probably spend 25 to 35 percent of my time on resource management issues. Hmm. Yes, Senator Rapace, of course. If, if I may, can I uh, sort of dovetail on what the Senator Steinberg was asking you about? And it relates to the Department uh, of Forestry after nine years finally passing some regulations regarding timber harvesting that impacts the protection of salmon. And as I'm sure you're aware, for the last couple of years, salmon industry has been shut down. So I'm wondering how, how you see your monitoring function or your, uh, relate, well, I wouldn't say relationship, I guess monitoring, enforcement, um, 
whatever, I don't know what the right term is, to judge the success of how that's working. Um, how do you view your, your role in all that? And how well, we have actually, the there's three separate types of monitoring that we do right now. Um, one of them is, is primarily research oriented in stream type monitoring to see uh, how much soil is entering the water, if you will. Um, and that does, that's only for s some small areas. But we do active uh, monitoring called hill slope monitoring of, uh, to ensure that, uh, excuse me, the monitoring is actually to make sure that uh, the wood products industry is harvesting timber in the manner that which is prescribed by their plans. Then once a plan is uh, completed, we do the hill slope monitoring and find out what the effects of that harvest are and whether or not we're seeing erosion. And, and so we'll continue to do that. And that type of, of monitoring, by the way, I, want to, I don't want to mislead you that we do this on every plan. It's mm -hmm. done by random sample. About 10% of the completed plans see a monitoring. And so those that have been doing this monitoring for years will continue to do this monitoring and see if, if there's a, an actual effect on the protection for the riparian areas and the water courses. Okay, very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It does concern me just a little bit, just from an accounting budget perspective, if you, you, you budgeted essentially 5% for forest management and you're spending 25% out of necessity, maybe that's something that the budget committee ought to, ought to be looking at too to see how we can reconcile that. Well, both the chair and Senator Orpeza's questions also touched on when we're, when we're talking about water quality or uh, you know, downstream uh, qu the quantity of water, quality of water downstream, um, the, the, the secret is, is that uh, in my district, uh, you guys are doing a wonderful job with the, the areas that you protect but we also have a lot of federal lands. And in my opinion, having watched this now for 11 years, a lot of the problem comes with um, a different philosophy maybe uh, regarding fire protection and water quality management and erosion after fire to pr protection with the feds. Um, Two years ago, we had all those fires up north, and I mean, I can remember one day when I had to make a phone call to my congressman who had to make a phone call to the Secretary of Interior to get the federal manager of the land up there to even allow you to get your bulldozers and your engines on their property to fight the fire that was less than a quarter of a mile away from the, the suburb of this town. What in... What has happened since two summers ago, if anything, in our ability to communicate and get on the same page with the feds, not only in the emergency response, which we've kind of worked out, but in the subsequent water quality and erosion problems afterwards? Anything happening? There are a couple things that have happened. One is the communication between myself and the regional forester. I spoke with Randy Moore as late as yesterday. And we're gonna get I wasn't going to name names. Okay. But nonetheless, he is the regional forester for the United States Forest Service in California. And uh, I'm going to be talking to him and also the directors of Interior on Friday regarding fire management in that realm. But also something happened earlier uh, last year, and that was a, a U.S. District Court decision on, it was a roadless issue in Southern California, a roadless issue, in other words, uh, determining, uh, it, it had to do with the United States forest, national forest and forest management planning in those, and our role in that. And as a determination, it, uh, it stated that uh, the states have an inherent interest in the management of the national forest within their boundaries. And that is uh, something that uh, struck me um, as a responsibility that will require more discussion. Uh, they're going over their planning rules here now, uh, and we will become engaged in that. Two year, three years ago in the Tahoe Forest, the governors of this state and Nevada got together and they actually did something about fuel reduction, which actually took place and has provided uh, a, a higher level of safety, I believe, in that area than maybe other districts of our state. 
Can you tell me, uh, I, I know this isn't necessarily your departments, but it has to do with resource management. And, and uh, what, what is the CAL FIRE's philosophy about fuel reduction, not just in alternative energy standard, but just getting rid of the slash that's causing every lightning strike to be a, a, a ca catastrophe in this state? Well, it is part of the, uh, you know, the, the reduction of that for, for timber harvest. Those areas that have not been harvested um, that are outside of, you know, uh, the 100-foot uh, zone around structures is something that is hard for us to address, really, uh, on private property because we don't manage it. Um, so that's really where that lies. I mean, we can give advice to property owners on how to... To, to deal with that, but it's really their responsibility to provide that fuel reduction for those areas that are outside of the public resources code uh, requirements. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions? Witnesses in support, please. You'll, I'm sorry, you only get to testify once per hearing. Art was it? So. Okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman and Senators, I'm Bob Raymer, uh, Senior Engineer with the California Building Industry Association. And uh, I've been asked to say a Me Too on behalf of the California Business Properties Association. Uh, and we're in strong support of Dell's confirmation. Uh, I would like to say uh, I, I've worked for many years in the area of building codes. Uh, probably not the sexiest, you know, thing to do here at the Capitol, but I, I say rather important and one of the things that sort of distinguishes Cal Fire in the office of the state fire marshal from a host of other state agencies is that so many state agencies spend the lion's share of their time developing and adopting regulations and once they're finished with the adoption they move back to the development of more regulations uh, unlike those agencies the uh, office of the state fire marshal and Cal Fire has put together a rather comprehensive training and education program that goes along with the regulations. And it is this training and education effort that has made all the difference in the world. Uh, we just recently implemented the nation's first set of urban wildland interface fire safety building standards. Uh, rather stringent set of standards, uh, but they made sure that they were cost effective in their development and more importantly, they have gone to the 500 plus jurisdictions, making sure that the plan checkers, the building officials, the in-site inspectors, the subcontractors, the builders, the designers understand these regulations. And it was that second effort that made the transition to these new standards so smooth. And we appreciate that greatly. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Late afternoon, Chairman and esteemed board. I am Don Boland, Executive Director, California Utility Emergency Association, your largest and oldest utility association in the state. And I'm here in support of Director Walters as he has raised our cooperation in interdepartment working between Cal Fire and the public utilities and investor owned utilities to a level I have never seen. We have a cooperative environment where our lifelines travel through his burn areas. They put his firefighters in jeopardy, and we work with him on a daily basis, both in the fire season and out of the fire season, to reduce and mitigate the loss of any of your lifelines, whether they be telecommunications, power, water, wastewater, or gas pipelines. And to that degree, he has opened his door and his policy and his department given us unlimited access, and we then committed unlimited support. And with that, I strongly recommend his confirmation. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and Honorable Committee members. My name is Sheldon Gilbert. I'm the Fire Chief of the Alameda County Fire Department, but I also serve as the President of the California Fire Chiefs Association. And on behalf of the 625 uh, local government uh, fire chiefs that we represent, we would strongly like to support uh, uh, Dell in his confirmation of this position. He has been a visionary and a great partner for local government in the restructuring of our financial uh, institutions at the local and the state level. It is becoming more imperative than ever that we be integrated and, and really depend
depend on one another to meet the state and the local community's fire service needs. This is an all risk system. It's one of the best systems in the nation and it's something that uh, Dell has supported and continues to support and we certainly support him in this, in this role. So thank you very much and I, I do uh, encourage you to confirm him. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Reed. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman and members, Aaron Reed proudly representing the CDF firefighters, the men and women who fight the fires as well as the resource management uh, employees. I've been doing this for 31 years and I know that I can say that Dell is one of the finest directors I've ever known. Uh, and, and on behalf of the president of CDF firefighters who unfortunately couldn't be here, he's out of state in Arizona at a fire training meeting, uh, he wanted me to say that if he were here, he would say he's the finest director in the department's history. So I wanna quote Bob Wolf as with those remarks. Uh, I can also say that Dell brings a really unique uh, perspective to, to working with his employees. You don't often see the employees in top management getting along really well. They do in this department. It's like a family. I truly mean that. And if you ask any of them, they, they believe it's a family operation and they respect their leader enormously. So I wanna leave you with that thought. Uh, you won't find that in very many other departments in state government or in local government. And all this from a, a career employee who's dedicated his life to not only working for the state, but, but taking care of the, the men and women who work so very hard in that department. So we're here proudly supporting his confirmation. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, my name is David Bischel. I'm president of the California Forestry Association. We represent the uh, private working force of the state as well as uh, the primary producers of all types of uh, forest products and renewable bioenergy. Uh, we have worked with Dell in many capacities and I have to say that I think he's probably the most qualified uh, director that uh, we have seen in uh, many, many years with his uh, forestry education and background as well as his many years of experience with CDF both in resource and forest management. Uh, we strongly support his confirmation and we very much appreciate the outreach that he has made to the National Forest, to the Regional Forester and trying to uh, work with them to develop a coordinated uh, statewide uh, forest uh, uh, fire and suppression and, and prevention plan and I think that uh, uh, he is uh, uh, really unique in that respect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Fisher. Thank you. Moved by uh, Senator Onestead. Um, I'm happy to support your confirmation. Uh, I think the testimony uh, speaks to uh, your, your effectiveness and professionalism. We all are concerned, and I just want to reiterate it, about the relationship between your department and the state's general fund. And <clears throat> you're not immune here or being singled out in any way with that concern. Uh, this is across the board, but there are questions we want you to look at, we want our budget committee to look at. Um, are we being fully compensated for the cost of contracted fire suppression? Um, is the department involved increasingly in, in, uh, in duties that uh, cost more than what we are budgeting? resource management. Uh, what about the use of your emergency fund and, and how is that operating? Um, and so we ask you to be sensitive to all of that as, as no budget decision um, can be taken alone. It has to be seen in context with everything else that we deal with and we wanna continue to work with you to make sure that you can do your job effectively and at the same time to minimize any impact on the general fund. With that, I appreciate let's call that. the roll. Senator Cedillo? Aye. Okay. Cedillo, I Dutton. Oropesa? Aye. Oropesa, I Honested? Aye. Honested, I Steinberg? Aye. Steinberg, I. Very good. Uh, your nomination was four to nothing. I don't know if Senator Dutton is, uh, is back. We'll keep the roll open for now. And uh, your nomination will move to the floor. Congratulations. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. <laughs> All right, we have a little bit of business left. Um, Ina, can we uh, finish? I think it'll take. 
Oh, you don't do all that, so. No, 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 no. No, I just wanted to make sure you were all right. Okay, um, let me ask senators, let me ask the other senators, especially Senator Honestad, if he's uh, not choking. Um, items three through nine, uh, any questions, concerns, anything? Uh, Okay, let's take a motion then. Is anybody else? Does Senator Dutton have a question on? Well, since he's. He's on his way with you. Oh, he is on his way. Okay, so he wants to abstain on which numbers? I'm sorry. Six, eight, and the walk-on. Six, eight, and the walk-on. Okay. Um, so let's take three, four, five, seven, and nine. A motion moved by Senator Rapeza. Please call the roll. Senator Cedillo. Sadio I. Dutton, Oropesa, Oropesa I. Honested, Honested I. Steinberg, I. Steinberg I. All right, we'll leave that open for Senator Dutton. Now let's do six and eight. I guess we could have done them all together, but uh, six and eight moved again by Senator Oropesa. Please call the roll. Senators Sadio, Sadio I. Dutton, Oropesa, Oropesa I. Honested, Honested I. Steinberg, I. Steinberg I. Uh, those pass, uh, and since Senator Dutton wanted to abstain uh, on that, we'll close the roll on those two matters. We have one walk on. on. He had requested a consultant. Perhaps we should just wait on that. Give him the committee to wait on the consultant. The walk-on, uh, we'll approve the, uh, well, the recommendation is to approve the establishment of Senator Wright's uh, Select Committee on Jobs, uh, and uh, our Secretary of the Senate will deal with uh, the personnel-related issues on, on that matter. Moved by Senator Rapesa. Senator Cedillo. Cedillo I. Dutton. Oropesa? Oropesa I. Honested? Yeah. Honested I. Steinberg? I. Steinberg I. Okay, that's 4 nothing with an abstention. Uh, that's all the business we have. We'll ask Senator. We have one more. We have the whole bill. About the disposition of this bill, whether it should go to budget or to energy. And it was the guy said either way. Oh, this is the, uh, I, I would want to, hmm, I, I'd like to consult with the energy chair here. This is, have you talked to the chair of the energy committee, Senator Cedillo? Can we, uh, how, do, how do we do this to maintain the option and not lose the time? Just uh, hold off until you have the conversation and I'll pull with you. Oh, that's fine. Let, let's hold off on this matter until we can talk to the chair. Just, just the one bill or the whole package? The one. Want to hold off on the whole package, or no, we'll do the, the, the reference of bills. Uh, need a motion, with the exception of XB X831 by Senator Cedillo, which we'll pull after we've had a chance to talk to the chair. Fair enough. Okay. okay. It'll be it'll be all right. I promise. Okay. Call call the roll. Senator Cedillo. Aye. Cedillo I. Dutton. Aye. Dutton I. Orpesa. Orpesa I. Honested. Anastad I. Steinberg? Aye. Steinberg, aye. Senator Dutton, I understand you want to abstain from items six and eight, but uh, you can add on to the other items. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, uh, seven, and nine. Yes. Please call the roll of uh, the absent member on those, on those remaining Senator items. Senator Dutton? Aye. Dutton, aye. All right, those measures pass. There's no other business to come before the committee. Oh. What, what's the issue? Oh, never mind. No, We're done. Okay, thank you all very much. I'm sorry. Do we, oh, we have an executive session. Never mind.